<laughs> do. It's so weird to hear your your voice over this thing, all of you, because I've heard your podcast and it's kind of like, <laughs> it's really spooky, but really fun. Yeah. <laughs> We're real people. Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I am your host, Sean Hartman, aspiring analytics analysis aficionado. I'm Jeremy Ruggles, collector of animals playing sports Christmas ornaments. And I'm Peter Cook, a corrupt tropical gangster. Ooh. Is there anyone else in the house? There's someone else here. I know it. Hey, I'm Lauren from the Great White North. <laughs> wow. Lauren. It's true. From the Great White North. That's right. Thank you for being our first international guest on I'd Buy That for a Dollar. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> our, our podcast is officially cultured now. <laughs> so how many meters of snow are you buried under? <laughs> You know, I, I lost track. Uh, I stopped counting. I don't go outside anymore. And it's not just because of the pandemic. I used meters because I'm cultured. <laughs> we used feet up here too. It's fine. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> so, Lauren Ram, you are in Toronto, correct? That's correct. I'm in Toronto. Are you on this podcast because you have a background with records? <laughs> I sure hope so. I <laughs> I collect records and I share them online on my Instagram. And I've been collecting records for probably about 15 years or so. Nice. Mm. And that your Instagram is at Lauren Ram? I actually changed it. Ooh. Yeah, no, it's all good. I changed it today to uh, at Wordy Rapping Hood after the Tom Tom Club song. Uh, uh, Wordy underscore Rapping Hood. So. Hell yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. You got the specifics. <laughs> and so so you've done some DJing in your time? Yeah. When I was an undergrad, I had a college radio show for many years. And that sort of led me to better appreciate records and how to play them, like physically the actual technique of it. And I started DJing as an undergrad. And when I moved to Toronto, I started playing my collection out to bars and clubs it's something I miss, you know, with the pandemic. I can't do that right now, but it's a, I really enjoy it. It's one of the reasons why I love collecting records so much is to find songs that I can, that I can play out. Well, that's great. And you have brought a real party banger <laughs> for us today. Right. Why don't you tell us what you brought us? Yeah. So I'm really excited to talk about this record. It's uh, Tropical Gangsters by Kid Creole and the Coconuts, and it's full of bangers. I've played it out many times. <laughs> It's actually one of the first records I ever bought, probably yeah, around 16, 17 years ago, back when I was an undergrad in Kingston, Ontario. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Where did you buy? What Peter, Peter, you brought me the wrong record. This one says Wise Guy. <laughs> oh, no. They're the same oh, record. It's fine. <laughs> we'll get to oh, it. Oh, they are. Okay. <laughs> Whew. Thought we were in I'm, trouble here. <laughs> I'm being a wise guy. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So that's okay. we, we'll mention that up front. We can talk a little bit more about the reasoning. But yeah, in the UK, the UK and Europe, this was released by Z or Z E. I'm not sure how to say that label. That label's name. Do you know, Lauren? If it's Z or Z E, I believe the it's label? Z. It's named after the two founders. It's like a an acronym with their two names. I think mm -hmm. it's just Z Records. But I couldn't find any concrete co uh, confirmation of that. We're going to go with that. So it was a uh, Z and Ireland jointly released it as tropical gangsters in the UK and Europe, where Kid Creole and the Coconuts had a huge following. Mm -hmm. In the US and Canada, it was released by Z and Sire as Wise Guy with different artwork. Mm -hmm. Very confusing. And, yeah, <laughs> it's very very confusing. But it's, as far as I can tell, it's the same record. Otherwise, the musically, mm -hmm. yeah. The, yeah, it's the same track list. It's the same same song, same mix, just a different cover and a different title. 
Excellent. Well, we can talk a little more about the record when we come back, but how about we just get started with a song? Where do you want to start for the people? Yeah, so I want to start with a song called I'm Corrupt. Just a bit of back information here with this record. Like I said, I bought this record in Kingston. And for your listeners who maybe live live in Southern Ontario, may be familiar with a record store called Brian's Record Option. It's a bit of an institution in this part of the country. It's basically like a dollar bin of a record store. It's like very disorganized, really, really messy. I used to bring hand sanitizer with me when I went there because my hands were so like grimy and messy afterwards. Oh, those are the best. Right? <laughs> so Brian is like the nicest guy. He, It's disorganized, but he knows what he has and he will sell it to you for a fair price. Side note, it was recently flooded, but they've reopened the shop and it's it's back and running hopefully pandemic notwithstanding. But I found out about this record because the song Stool Pigeon was sampled by the Avalanches on their Since I Left You record on the song Close to You. And I I knew about that and I found the record and I played it. And it's interesting because like the album is really hard to place. And when it comes to like the genre, it has a mix of a lot of different influences because it came out of this like New York City late 70s era of like a lot of different genres sort of being developed in one one space, but a very small amount of time. And I always thought of like that New York City scene as like really highbrow and like super intellectual. And I didn't associate Kid Creole with that era of New York City, but it's actually very much a part of it. And we'll get to that later. But I I really love this record. I'm Corrupt is my favorite song on it. It's got this great like four on the floor disco beat. It's got a tropical drum beat as well. Some strong like punk bass lines and keyboards that kind of carry the song. And I remember when I first bought the record and I played it out at a party and, and folks on it turned their heads and asked me what it was because it's just so out there and different. But yeah, I'd love to I'd love to play it. The message behind the song, basically it's like someone owning up to how terrible a romantic partner they are. And that's sort of the message of a lot of the Kid Creole songs and we'll we'll get to that later. But yeah, it's a it's a really great a really great team to start with. Yeah. And interestingly, this is not going to prominently feature the Kid Creole character and the person <laughs> behind that, which we'll get to more when, when we come back. But let's get into I'm Corrupt. Side one, track four. Thank you, Jeremy. Like you said, there's so much going on with the influences, even on just that first song. You know, I think at first listen, it's easy to think like, oh, it's kind of a 
slightly tropical sounding disco ish song. But the more you listen to it, there's just so much it like leading in to what they're playing. Like there's some of the new wave influence, a little bit of the punk influence, a lot of uh, Calypso and reggae and like two tone influence going on. And then also a lot of that, that classic New York Latin disco scene. And it all just works mm-hmm. so perfectly. Yeah, it definitely does. It's sort of part of this. I think it's something that we do as like people who listen to music is try to define or like box music into different genres and really clarify what those genres sound like and don't sound like. Mm -hmm. But what's really great about this album and this song in particular is that it kind of like melds them all together in this sort of like mutant disco (laughs) genre. And it's like disco kind of explored through an international or like a punk lens which i think kind of defies like any sort of definition or genre definitely and it, it's that's the real trick is is blending it all you know I, i've heard records where different tracks have totally different genre feels so they can show off their range but when you can make it all cohesively work together somehow that's that's a good thing i think it speaks to like the scene in new york city at the time where there's this like melting pot of like new wave and hip hop and punk and disco and neoclassical that are all being developed in a very small space geographically over like the course of a decade. And I can imagine like August Darnell or Kid Creole kind of just learning through observing as a producer or as a musician, as a performer, and just kind of blending all those sounds together into this cohesive album. Definitely. And uh, we've, we've talked about disco and some of the controversy and scenes surrounding it a few times on the podcast. And I think a lot of people think of disco as this very rigid genre, typically thinking of the more like mainstream prepackaged disco records that got popular. But when you go down to more of this like kind of cutting edge New York scene, there's a real sense of adventure with it. I mean, the scene surrounding it from everything I know was, was uh, it was a musical statement it was a societal statement like the the new york disco scene was closely intertwined with the growing gay community and there was you know this new sense of acceptance and freedom with the music and it's it really shows with albums like this more so than you know any like bg's record that you're going to listen to absolutely i think that's such a good point too when it comes to conversations about disco I mean like here we are decades later and it's so easy to look at it through this lens of the more popular disco records like you mentioned the Bee Gees or Donna Summer even these records kind of stand the test of time and represent that genre in like this big umbrella way but you're right like disco came out of a scene of people who felt isolated disadvantaged advantaged in some ways because they weren't part of the mainstream and so they developed their own genre and their own space where they could be themselves authentically and share this like community of people like you think of like the loft parties with Dave Mancuso and Paradise Garage and all these other places where like people who felt really marginalized in society came together and like built this wonderful loving community I mean they're certainly looking at it through rose tinted glasses I'm sure there's a lot more nuance there but it's so it's such a magical thing to think about, especially now. And I think it's so much more than just like the heavy hitters of disco. Absolutely. And it's really sad the way disco evolved to become this more elitist mainstream statement and culture where like then other people were not allowed to to participate. Yeah, or I've had it before while I'll play a record and someone will be like, Wow, this is a great funk record. I'm like, well it's a it's a disco record. Like, no, I don't like disco and I like this, so it can't be disco. It's like it's it's a genre term. It's not a bad word. <laughs> Absolutely. Which I think gets to that other idea of like I think as music listeners or just as people, I think we're really interested in driving very clear lines between where one genre starts and the next begins and like never the two shall meet kind of thing, which is like absurd to think about when you really think about what music is and how even someone like Kid Creole or August Darnell would exist in the world as someone who was, you know, participated in a lot of different genres as a, as a musician. So it's just absurd to think that anyone would act that way in the world. <laughs> in one of the clips that I was watching in preparation for this, 
August Darnell, aka Kid Creel, I think we've established that they're one and the same person by this point. <laughs> Uh, in that clip, he was saying that because of their eclectic nature, that radio didn't know how to categorize Kid Creole and the coconuts, especially in the U.S., and therefore it limited their airplay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I read an interview with him and his then wife, Adriana, who helped form the band, and they asked them, you know, why is it that Kid Creole and the Coconuts, specifically Tropical Gangsters as an album, was so successful in in Europe and in Australia, but not in the U.S. And they, she just said outright, well, it's because folks in the U.S. are not as interested in bands that are difficult to define in terms of genre, but also are made up of people of color as well as white people, like the mixing. It's like they don't, there's like something they don't like. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. We're a simple people down here. We just like our racism. (laughs) We like our (laughs) clearly defined classic rock genres. Beef jerky. Yep. Well, If uh, if racism and homophobia was good enough for our grandparents, then God damn it, it's good enough for us too. (laughs) Well, hey, it wasn't a success in Canada either, so... (laughs) <laughs> well, speaking of corruption, and while we're still on that song, um, it's worth noting that that one was written by longtime Kid Creole and the Coconuts bandmate Andy Hernandez, who went by the stage name Cody Mundi. And he is noticeably absent from this album, since it was originally intended to be a Kid Creole solo album. And uh, Lauren, I'm sure you are prepared to talk more about that a little later. But this song, he was upset because this was going to be his contribution to the album. And this song was included as a mostly instrumental track since I guess lyrically it wasn't in the theme with the rest of the record. It was determined, but you know, the thing is I like it as it exists on the record. I'll say I haven't heard, I think that um, (laughs) Cody Mooney did eventually release a version with the full verses and whatnot, but I have not yet heard it. Why'd they cut Cody Mooney out? What happened? Well, we'll get there. I don't know uh, exactly where we want to go from here. There is obviously a concept with this record, as I as I understand it, there were with previous Kid Creole releases. And that's this whole thing where they're apparently supposed to be stranded on a fictional island called Badilly Bay. <laughs> this is I'm getting this from the liner notes of Wise Guy. It's, it says, on February 15th, the banana boat was shipwrecked off Brindisi Reef, the survivors awoke on Badilly Bay. They remained there for nearly six months. Uh, here, then, is the true untold story of their gruesome ordeal, the music they were forced to play, the mates they were allowed to choose, and the escape they were bound to make. <laughs> is, is, this, is there anything like this in the liner notes to uh, tr- the Tropical Gangsters version of this, Lauren? I don't believe there are, but you'll notice on the cover of Tropical Gangsters, they look like they're going to a tropical island. Someone is holding a banana and one of the, in the center, you'll see a suitcase with like a, an image of a, of a, an airplane, I believe. So there's like definitely a theme of like, we're not where we should be. Okay. Yeah. I actually, I'm just going to say as a side note, I don't remember if the, of the, if the record has that on the back. I'll read what it actually says on the back of the record too. It says uh, Kid Creole and the Coconuts are washed upon the shore of Badilly Bay, island of sinners ruled by outcasts where crime is the only passport <laughs> and race music the only way out. There's a very old term that we've brought up on the show before, race music. <laughs> so they're going with a uh, I don't know if this is like a 1920s gangsters theme or something. It's mm-hmm. very interesting and unique though. And I don't know how much any of the music and lyrics actually play into that theme. No, I don't think they do. I think the the music and lyrics are mainly part of that shtick of Kid Creole being like a ladies man who thinks very highly of himself and likes to go from city to city and just have a, you know, a woman in every city. It's like he, I guess, it is an outlaw, sort of a gangster, but he's more just like a ne'er-do-well Don Giovanni, who just wants to sleep with as many women as he can. Yeah, that's where I couldn't tell where the persona of Kid Creole and the real August Darnell, I couldn't tell where that line (laughs) actually was. (laughs) There's definitely a a character being played, but I wasn't sure how true it was to the the person behind Kid Creole. You know who I'm just now realizing that the uh, character of Kid Creole reminds me of is the 
the general stage character of Morris Day oh. <laughs> from the time. Oh my God. Yeah. He definitely has Morris Day energy. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yeah. That was actually a group that I could think of as being at least, if not totally musically, at least uh, spiritually is what I want to say. That might not be the right word, but there's definitely something going on, some a similar energy. Mm-hmm. to more stay in the time similar aesthetic maybe but it feels very like like very tongue-in-cheek like it's obviously they're kind of in on the joke sort of thing yeah yeah totally absolutely yeah. but it's fun it's so fun this is a real party record i this uh honestly this is uh i'll say it now this is probably one of my favorite records that i was not familiar with before we brought it to the podcast. I, I didn't really know this record. Now, that said, a couple songs sounded really familiar, and I don't know if it's because I know them as hits or if they're just kind of grabbing from so many different genres and genre hopping that maybe they sound like other things I'm familiar with. Yeah, I think that, like, it's a shame. I, I think about this often because a lot of the tracks on this record that we'll get to later, very like they sound very much like they could be sampled by people working today or musicians today. But sadly, a lot of them aren't. And they still sound familiar because, like you say, they grab from so many different genres, but they still sound so fresh and they could, you know, pop up in a sample today and they would sound great. Oh, yeah. I couldn't believe this record was from 1982. It's been around since I was two years old and I'm just (laughs) hearing it now and it seems timeless in a lot of ways. It's funny, like some of their, their, so this is their third record, like you said, released in 1982, but they had two prior to this. And I would say their second record sounds incredibly fresh. Like it's from 1980 and it literally sounds like it was released in the later half of that decade because it's so inventive and genre defying, as I've mentioned with the, this record, it, it kind of bounces around and you just get the sense that they were having a lot of fun in the studio, just exploring different avenues. And it sounds so, like I said, fresh. It sounds like it's not from 1980. Yeah, some of the sounds, the auxiliary sounds almost seem like a precursor to New Jack Swing. Yeah, <laughs> totally. It definitely has that vibe amazing well it's interesting because like i was doing some research into kid creole and sort of or august darnell i should start by saying like august darnell is the person and kid creole is as we've established the the character and he co-founded the band with his friend andy hernandez cody mundi and his wife adriana kg who also actually designed the band's wardrobe and did some of the choreography the shtick is that kid creole is a ladies man he's like really kind of like toxic masculinity come to life. And the band is like aesthetically influenced by the big band era of the 40s, sort of like Zoot Suits and Cab Calloway style. But it's a mix of different genres as we discussed. But this was their third record. It was, as we said, meant to be Darnell's solo album, but he was pressured to release it as a Kid Creole album because they thought it would be more commercially successful. And it turns out they were right. The record was actually the most commercially successful record that Z Records ever released. Wow. But when you when you look at the cover of the album of, of Tropical Gangsters, you it, you feels like you can kind of see Darnell's like disdain in his face. He kind of looks a little bit a little bit crestfallen <laughs> because the album I mean, there's so much to say about the recording process here because it was recorded at Blank Tapes and Electric Ladyland in New York City, two very well-renowned studios. But Darnell's co-founder, Andy Hernandez, was not was not there. Like he wasn't invited to do to record the album with them. So it went on to be a huge, massive success in the UK. But Darnell actually hated the record. He kind of said that. He, he didn't love the record when it came out, but it because it was such a commercially successful record and he was able to sort of like tour and travel and he ended up moving to the UK and I believe still lives there. He said, and I quote, I couldn't listen to the album for a long time because I thought it was a cop out. It was a compromise, but then you get massive success, money, lots of traveling and a great lifestyle. And you say, if this is what it takes. <laughs> Basically, he's saying like it is what it is. Yeah, it's really funny how that tends to be the case. You find out where the, an artist's most successful work that comes to define them is where they 
feel like they had to compromise their vision, but then ultimately they kind of warm up to it over time and money. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> That's all that it takes. But it's interesting because like the the album was such a commercially successful record outside of the US and outside of Canada. But it's, I think, I mean, you guys can maybe speak to this as well as like, it's kind of largely seen as like a pop record that isn't super serious, but it's a very good record. It's a well-produced record. It's a, as we've said, it's like a genre bending record, but it's like not seen as like highbrow, like a lot of the other records of that era in the New York scene were, were seen. I hadn't even heard of it. And I thought Peter like made it up or something when he first mentioned we were going to do this album. I was like, that's a fake title. <laughs> yeah, I'm, we're just going to talk about Kid Creel and the Coconuts, Tropical Gangsters. I can see where you would think that that was just some goof I was pulling on you. <laughs> yeah, then I listened to it and was like, this could pass as like 2000s era indie rock. Yeah, this would be like the fun indie rock band that in 2004 was making waves. Oh my gosh. There was like a, a weird strain of indie bands at that time that were really digging on like Tropicalia influences too. So yeah, and da yeah. dance stuff too, like that chick 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 band. Yes. I yeah. was actually in doing research for this uh episode, I was I did this um I found a really great article about the legacy of Blank Tapes, the studio where this album was released. And they mentioned sort of this resurgence in dance music in in uh, the early 2000s in New York City with bands like Hercules and Love Affair. LCD Sound System obviously is a big one and, and all of the DFA catalog. But like mm -hmm. they kind of come from that legacy of blending genres. And like, again, through that lens of disco, because Blank Tapes, which unfortunately like doesn't exist anymore, they were known as a label or a, sorry, a, a studio that catered to this weird genre called mutant disco, which I wanted to talk a bit about because the record label that Kid Creole was on, Z Records, was actually pretty renowned for releasing kind of out there music. So people like Alan Vega from Suicide, Lizzie Mercier de Clou, The Waitresses, uh, Lydia Lunch were all on Z Records. And it's like, these are bands and musicians who kind of like form in your mind this idea of like highbrow art rock. And Kid Creole was part of that scene. But because they obtained hmm. this like massive commercial like, success across the pond, their integrity or their, they weren't seen as, as like, a musician's musician, even though when you look at August Darnell's history and what he did before Kid Creole and the Coconuts, like he's incredibly prolific and an amazing musician and producer. I can think of a few parallels in other New York scene bands, you know, like a lot of what we think of now as the, the, the front runners of new wave and punk and no wave at the time, we're all playing together at the same clubs in New York. And it, it I don't think they were really separated in people's minds as much until some of the bands got big. And it's like, oh, well, Blondie's a, you know, a big new wave band. They're not a punk band. It's like, well, but they played shows with all these other people. They're friends with all of them. Why do they have <laughs> yeah. to be so separate? I remember, now? uh, I, who's the guitarist from Blondie? Chris. Chris Stein. Yes. Um, thank you. I remember hearing a story where Chris Stein, I think at CBGB's approached Lydia lunch to say that he really, liked Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. And I think her response was, so? <laughs> like, really? <laughs> but but yeah, to think that something like uh, Teenage Jesus and the Jerks, and which is, you know, way out there and aggressive and brutal and Blondie were sharing the same spaces. Yeah, totally. And if yeah. you ever read, like, Just Kids by Patti Smith. A great or, book. Great book. Oh, my God. So good. I didn't want it to end. And Kim Gordon's autobiography about her time in Sonic Youth and, and being in New York City at that time. It's, like, wild to think that a band like Sonic Youth was about to release, like, their first records just at the cusp of, like, or just at the end of, like, records like this one were being released inside sort of that same same kind of culture, that same space and community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, really blossom of creativity going in so many different directions. Um, totally. We, sh 
we should probably play another song clip. What did you want to hear next? Yeah, so this is the first track on Tropical Gangsters uh, called Annie, I'm Not Your Daddy, which is a song about exactly what you think it is, a man denying paternity of a woman named Annie. Um, <laughs> but it goes a lot. It's like a terrible terrible song or terrible message when you listen to it or just read the lyrics but the beginning of this track is the reason why I want to play it it's just absolutely outstanding I think it's maybe one of the best intros of any song ever which quite the statement I know but it's shocking to me that this song in the intro specifically isn't sampled by more musicians like a Mad Lib or something I did look into seeing who has sampled it and it's mostly like house bands and stuff like electronic musicians um, oh, not so in the much UK. Yeah, exactly. But it's like a lot of like musicians coming out of the UK, which makes sense because they probably like grew up on this record given that it was bigger over there. But yeah, let's let's play it. It's a really good one. All right. Let's hear that song. That great but horrible song. <laughs> Talking about the variety of influences that are evident on this record, that pre-chorus where he says, I'm telling it to you, the melody is so XTC. Like, <laughs> I just hear like an XTC song at that portion, you know, nowhere else in the song, but oh, I could swear that was from like Skylarking or English Settlement or something. It's so funny you say that because I actually wrote that in my notes later on about their record before this one. It's very, it really reminds me of English Settlement. Oh, really? Sure. I did. Yeah. That's <laughs> incredible on the same way on the same wavelength there. Totally. That's that's a great. I mean, yeah, there was some uh, lyrically woof, woof, but uh, structurally and as you said, that intro magical, phenomenal. Hmm. Yeah, it's like a, it's just such a great way to start the album. It just like sucks you right in. It's such a offensive song, but you can't help but dance to it. That's how they get you. (laughs) (laughs) 
So August Darnell will uh, slip his agenda in there. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about August Darnell because there's so much to say about him. And I want to kind of condense it because I feel like a whole book could be written about his story, like even before he joined the band or formed the band. So before he was in Kid Creole and the Coconuts, he was in a band with his brother called Dr. Buzzard's Original Savannah Band. Look them up. It's just like disco cheese. But believe it or not, they were actually managed by Tommy Matola. That Tommy Matola, the guy who <laughs> was married to Mariah Carey. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. The Sony I guy. Any... Yeah, I, I think it's, it's I think he's Sony, but he like was the one who discovered Hall & Oates or something. Yeah, he's major. Yeah, yeah. Pretty, pretty extra. Definitely worth reading Mariah Carey's memoir. Anyway, that's a, I digress. Um, <laughs> So after leaving Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah band, it's a real mouthful, uh, he left the band, kind of split up from his brother, and he dabbled in music production. He never really formally was trained in that, but he just sort of hung out at the studio when he was in that band and others to just sort of learn the ropes and understand how music production worked. And he ended up producing and writing for two other really incredible dollar bin records that I just want to quickly touch on. The first one is Machines There But For The Grace Of God Go I, which is a fantastic disco standard. Uh, yeah, like, another another one with questionable lyrics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's I think it's a very self-aware song. Like yeah. It's not actually saying they don't like these other groups of people. They're yeah. just saying like those who do not like them are too judgmental but yeah that song or that album he wrote that song he produced the album <clears throat> and he also wrote and produced on Don Armando's Second Avenue Rumba Band which is another mouthful so the song going to a show uh, showdown from that record is an earworm of a song it's really cheesy but I love it and it was actually written by Adriana KG his soon-to-be wife and Fonda Ray, who later joined as one of the Coconuts, she was actually singing on that record. So it's kind of interesting to think about like this existing in this New York City scene and like just a bunch of folks having fun in the studio and then like creating this band, sort of part of this new wave trend. And Kid Krill like performed at places like Mud Club and Paradise Garage. I wanted to say that the album that precedes this, Fresh Fruit in Foreign Places, is like I think I said earlier, it's kind of like very exploratory and a little bit more off the wall, but maybe because they weren't like constrained by their record label to like put out something more commercially viable. It just sounds so inventive and ahead of its time and tracks like Table Manners and I Am remind me a lot of, of XTC. I know we didn't come here to talk about that record, but definitely worth worth talking about and mentioning. But yeah, I... I was just like reading about August Arnell and just like amazed by all of the sort of tangents and, and sort of people that he would be rubbing shoulders against. So where they recorded this record, Blank Tape Studio, it was where Arthur Russell and the B-52s and Bumblebee Unlimited all recorded uh, albums as well. And I think it's really interesting because I really feel that Kid Creole and the Coconuts is sort of in the same lane as Tom Tom Club, sort of mixing different influences and having this sort of more like, quote unquote, world beat feel. Mm -hmm. And then also a band like B-52s, which a lot of people would th think of as like, punk but aesthetically we're like kind of a throwback to a different and distinctive genre or sorry um decade namely the 50s where the kid creole and the coconuts were like more about the 30s and 40s and b52s are all about like throwback to the 50s i just think it's so funny and weird because we don't really think of that as like more forward thinking and punk in that way yeah there's also similarities of like a the kind of quirky sense of humor that they all used in the music. I think we don't often think of Tom Tom Club as this kind of like humorous band, but like there's a lot of goofy elements to the songs. It's just that they're all earworms. So people just dance to it and love it and don't think about how it's kind of silly music. What sometimes. you gonna do when you get out of jail? I'm gonna have some fun. <laughs> And also, speaking of rubbing shoulders with, you know, more aggressive music in New York, it looks like August Darnell also did some production on James White and the Black's Off-White album from 79, <laughs> also on Z Records. Which is wild. As a 
As a side yeah. note, like I was introduced to this era of music through the New York Noise compilations that uh, Soul Jazz Records put out. You know, you got your Glenn Branca and your Lizzie Mercier de Clou and all these other things. And I thought it was so highbrow and so cool. And at the same time, I had this record, Tropical Gangsters, and they work in completely different worlds. I had no idea there was any of this overlap. Mm -hmm. there, there's also the like kind of highbrow reissue label Strut Records from the UK, and they did a whole compilation of early August Darnell music, some of the early Kid Creole stuff, and some of the uh, production work he did with other bands that we were talking about. So we're not the only ones saying that this guy deserves a lot more respect than he is uh, receiving these days. Totally. And it makes you think about that quote where he's like, it is what it is. Like, he was able to have this really comfortable life, but you wonder if he felt like he was compromising on his musicianship or his skill. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when I started looking into the players on the album, the other people, some of the connections that I found. Jimmy Ripito, a.k.a. Jimmy Rip, is on guitar, and he worked with a bunch of people. I mean, we're talking big names, Jerry Lee Lewis, Mick Jagger, De Debbie Harry. Uh, but then he also worked with Tom Verlaine from television. And in some cases, when Richard Lloyd wasn't with television in the later years, Jimmy Ripp played guitar in television. And then later, he was the lead guitarist for Paul Collins and The Beat. Paul Collins was from the classic band The Nerves. Oh. So he's the guitarist on this record. We have Peter Schott on keyboards. And he also worked with a guy named Winston Grennan, who was a Jamaican drummer who also appears on this record. And Chad also worked with an American jazz guitarist named Eric Gale. We have a guy... Oh, yeah. Eric Gale rules. You know Eric Gale? Yeah. He's a great session player. Uh, a guy named Ron Rogers is credited. He's a producer from New York City and it was a frequent collaborator of August Darnell. Jay Stovall from Machine is also credited. And the, <laughs> I, the thing is, I don't know. It, it's just a bunch of names without specific designations. So I had to look into what these people did. I don't know what they did on every single instance on this but the bass i think the bass on this album is just above and beyond it's one of my favorite parts of the album beyond the songwriting and the production and that is provided by carol coleman from sean you're gonna like this she hails from philadelphia mm -hmm. and uh she's also worked with miko as well as a group called Elbow Bones and the Racketeers, which when I looked into it, turned out to be another August Darnell project. This guy was prolific. And uh, Dave Spann, also a drummer who had worked with Norman Connors, plays on here. Yogi Horton, an another American drummer who had worked with Aretha Franklin, Luther Vandross, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, Hall & Oates, Kenny G, and bringing it all back, the B-52s. So the connections that you were talking about, Lauren, I, I kept finding them over and over. We have Corey Day on vocals, and she had been in Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah band. And it seems that some of the more traditional Coconuts members are on here, like Adriana Kagi and Cheryl Poirier and Taryn Hagee. They must have at some point been brought in during the sessions to uh, put the more proper Kid Creel and the Coconuts touch on it. But the most interesting name that I found in there, at least uh, that I guess when I looked into the story, was a little more telling as to how things went after this album. There's a woman named Lori Eastside credited, and she had been the lead vocalist of the Coconuts on the first two albums. And she got fired at some point during the making of this album, much to the dismay of Andy Cody Mundi Hernandez. And that actually furthered the rift between him and Darnell. Lori went on to be a choreographer for Mick Jagger and is now a casting director for movies such as The Wrestler, The Art of Getting By, and You Were Never Really Here. So she went in a totally different direction after leaving The Coconuts. Uh, so that's just a little information on other people appearing on this fantastic record. And the Coconuts recorded their own album produced by the same producer who we're going to do the 45 on. Oh, the 45 that our listeners, that only our Patreons will hear? Only our Patreons are going to know. But it's David Kirschenbaum. Nice. 
I don't know why I threw that in there, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an opportunity to say, hey, you could always uh, support us on our Patreon, patreon.com slash I'd buy that podcast, or you can find the link in the show notes. It's also worth noting that you can really help us out by leaving a review on whatever podcast platform you hear us on. Kind words will help us grow. So that would be much appreciated, listener, dear listeners. But uh, yeah, Lauren, uh, did you have any other bio information on Mr. August Darnell? I think that's actually all that I that I have here in my notes. So what song would you like to play next? <laughs> so the next song I want to play is called The Love We Have, which I think is one of the last songs. One thing, actually, before we do that, I wanted to mention there's another song on here that I didn't select. It's the very last song on the album, and it's a lot more down tempo. It's not like a like a dance track. It's called No Fish Today. Love and it. It's so good because, and I think it ties into your last episode, because to me, lyrically, it's very much in the same vein as like, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, the Kinks. It reminds me of Lola versus the Power Man, like some of the tracks on there that articulate the struggles of like the working man and like not having enough food to eat. This song is very much in that same vein, and I think it showcases how you know, a lot of the songs on this album seem really silly lyrically, but this song is really about like the desperation of someone in poverty. And I think it shows the like the range that August Darnell has. Yeah, that's a good take on that. That might explain why I like it so much. Uh, there is probably a little bit of Kinks vibe going on here. That one, I mean, they all really landed for me on first listen, but this is one of the ones that I felt like the song has been with me my whole life and I'm just hearing it now. Mm -hmm. totally it's it reminds me of um i can't remember the name of the song on lola versus the power men but it feels very much like a like a ray davies track get back in the line that's exactly the one yeah exactly that one yeah, yeah totally. totally it's a great track it's like an interesting choice at the very end and you kind of wonder if he august or may be like kind of it was like, okay, Z Records, like you forced me to do this album this way. Let me just have this one song that I really want on here that's a little bit outside of, you know, what we're doing. But um, it was, I'm really glad it's on there. All right. Well, let's hear that song. All right. Is, am I playing oh, that's the actually love? Not oh, the oh, oh no, I'm sorry. Yeah, we're not doing that. So, so <laughs> sorry, we're... I went on a tangent. I was going to say The Love We Have is another yeah. song I yeah, wanted to play. That's right. But well, I can. We aren't going to hear No Fish, No Fish Today for us, but. We'll listen no. <laughs> to the love we have. Yes. I 
I gotta say, that bass sound just does it for me. It's almost mixed like punky, but the parts are not actually punky. It's just like dry and piercing and thumping. Ugh, I don't even know what to say. It's nice. Yeah. It is nice. Yeah, I have in my notes here, the bass line is really what does it for me as well. It reminds me of like a Pretenders song. It has that like thick bass but then it also has horns so it's kind of a weird a weird mix as we've mentioned with the other songs <laughs> they're all a weird mix, melting this one pot especially. yeah <laughs> man the bass is really that element that elevates a good song to a great song though totally. you know it's the spice of not life a spice of well add a bit of spice i guess is what you can say do you guys watch do you guys are you guys on tiktok at all do you not not really. I have an account, but I don't think I've even logged into it on my new phone yet. Fair. There's a TikTok sound about Spice, but I will refrain from saying it, <laughs> <laughs> even though I kind of already did. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, all good. We haven't really ever brought up TikTok on the podcast. Another first. <laughs> <laughs> Breaking all kinds of new ground with this one. Nice. Well, speaking of no- other, another first is... I listened to the majority of the playlist that Sean put together for this episode before we recorded the episode. That's right. We have a Peter certified banger of a playlist this time. Absolutely. It's not just me telling you these songs are good. Oh, you did a great job, Sean. And Lauren, thank you for giving us some suggestions as well. Absolutely. Yep. Got those all on there. Uh, This is the longest playlist that I've made so far. This is clocking at just under two hours, but you know, if you want to have a a funky good afternoon or whatever, this is the playlist for you. It's our Spotify playlist. So um, I'll say I was also unfamiliar with this band and this album before this podcast. There's a lot uh, working against this album for me in some ways, like why I didn't pick it up. I love the music on it and I totally fucked up by not listening to them earlier. But I have like a natural aversion to band names of this style, like name and the somethings. I just, <laughs> I'm so unlikely to like a group that has that. I've found that it's such a big turnoff for me. And then, ah, man, stuff that just seems kind of cheesy and goofy, I'm so unlikely to pick up. And therefore, you fuck yeah, up. Once I got, in, <laughs> yeah, I fucked up. I didn't buy this record. <laughs> I could have been spinning this on <laughs> DJ nights of my own. And I will, I will be uh, fixing that mistake as soon as possible. But uh, yeah, diving into making this playlist was a lot of fun. Just really listening to all those elements, uh, informing the music here, and then exploring some of the things that were happening around this time or happened shortly beforehand that might have kind of played into the sound that they created. So I started off with a few I'd Buy That For A Dollar alums as usual we got uh, a material track on there evelyn champagne king and donna summer legit and then yeah and then some kind of some of the weirder um new york new wave-ish type stuff that was happening i put a malcolm mclaren track on there from his album Swamp <laughs> yeah, Thing. yeah that surprised me considering one of the earliest conversations i remember having with you was you just hating on malcolm mclaren and then he died like the next day <laughs> <laughs> question about that song buffalo love isn't that the song with the hat that pharrell made really famous the really giant hat the video of it features the hat does anyone know about this oh i don't even know okay i'm gonna google it right now <laughs> it's uh it's a pretty deep cut but it's a if you see the hat you'll know what i'm talking about <laughs> okay okay i also put a christina track on there which i believe was produced by august Darnell. I think he did uh, a handful of production or instrumentation work with her. Uh, It's from her album Doll in the Box, uh, which I believe was also on Z Records. And then we talked about some of that reggae two-tone influence going on there. So I put a track by the dub poet Linton Kwesi Johnson, title track off his album Forces of Victory, which is, I think, just maybe a year apart from this kid Creole record. And then... Some other kind of quirky new wave stuff. Oingo Boingo came to Mm -hmm. mind for me. That was a good inclusion. Yeah. And then another fun kind of goofy dollar bin record from that time period, Altered Images, the album Pinky Blue. And uh, Fun Boy 3 is another one of my kind of favorite forgotten uh, weirdo 
new wave groups that had a lot of a lot of different influences going into it as well put an odyssey track on there for some of the more straight up disco influence solo track from the singer sweet Pea atkinson who just passed away this may he was one of the singers from the band was not oh, was okay. yeah and then his uh he did some solo work on z records as well no production work from august darnell but the the song i put on there should i wait came out the same year on the same label so i'm sure they were bumping heads and i put for a possibly earlier influence the artist and this is okay this is an artist that i've not heard someone else pronounce it so i think it's coke escovedo do you guys know if that's pronounced differently i can't say that's how i would have read it i'm i'm pretty okay. sure you made it well. up so <laughs> just like this album that we're listening to <laughs> He's one of my favorite Latin-influenced jazz funk soul jazz artists, so I feel like that definitely influences some of the Latin disco elements that are going on here. I also put a Dr. Buzzard's track on there for the early August Darnell work. Uh, another Latin disco influence, the Fania All-Stars, which was a Latin and disco label that did a series of records uh, with this group called the Fania All-Stars, where usually the first half of the record was more of a traditional Latin style, and the second side of the record would be more of a traditional disco style, but played by a lot of the same artists. Uh, Salsa Orchestra after that with a similar Latin disco aesthetic, and then we put uh, Lauren's suggestions on there. I don't know if you want to mention the few songs you had suggested. Sure. Yeah, so we've got Machine, There But For The Grace Of God Go I, which, again, solid disco track, written and produced by August Darnell. Have you ever heard the Gories version of that song, the Detroit no. rock and soul band, the Gories? It was the same. I'm looking it up right now. It's worth checking out. It's awesome. It's my favorite cover of that song. Oh, damn. I'll definitely guess, check that out. I guess uh, Kid Creel and the Coconuts did a version as well. Oh, darn. I didn't know that either. I, I checked, to check that out. Yeah, it's it's a good take on it. So check that out. Sweet. I love it when a cover is done by the person who originally wrote it, but like a different different take or different style. Yeah, I put on Fonda Ray over uh, like a fat rat, which Fonda Ray was one of the coconuts. She didn't sing on this record, but she's she's a queen. Um, Tom Tom Club, Wordy Rapping Hood. Your new Insta handle. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just snuck that in there. And then also Don Armando's Second Avenue Rumba Band, Go Into a Showdown, written by August Darnell's then wife, Adriana KG. Really great disco cheese track. Cool. Yeah. And then we, we closed off the whole playlist with I'm a Wonderful or yeah, I'm a Wonderful Thing Baby by nice. Kid Creel, which is a track from this album that we have not featured. So that one was written by Peter Schott, the keyboardist on the album, and he I guess he wrote it as It's a Wonderful Thing, but Darnell changed it to be more egocentric, which does fit with the theme of Kid Creel and the Coconuts. <laughs> nice. Well, awesome. Yeah, check that playlist out. That'll be available. The, is it the day after the episodes air, Sean, that the Spotify playlist goes up? I usually make it available the same day, and then I just post about it the day after. So gotcha. if you uh, you know find our Spotify profile and are checking out what we're posting, you'll, you'll get it right away. I'd buy that podcast all one word. You find that on Spotify, and you can check out that playlist. Very eclectic and did you have uh, anything else, Lauren, that you wanted to discuss while you're here with us? No, I guess that just in terms of like record collecting in general, I would say that like a record like this really demonstrates that like when it comes to music, taste and genre doesn't really matter or even exist. So you just kind of have to go and have fun with it. And when you're collecting records, just like don't worry too much about the price. Just think about the value and, you know, enjoy. Wise words. Yeah. There's there's just as much heat in the dollar bin as there is in the uh, the top shelf rack. Totally. So we were going to end on a cert another certified banger. Not that I think just about every track is, but we were talking about going out on Stool Pigeon, which is probably the most Cab Calloway influenced track on this album. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely foreseeing, you know, I guess in the 80s, there was a little bit of like swing big band revival with, I don't know, I guess maybe with like the Stray Cats. But when you get into the 90s, obviously there was the Squirrel Nut Zippers and the Brian Setzer Orchestra. Of course, again, that's Brian Setzer from Stray Cats. I feel like they're they're ahead of the curve again here. 
with uh, mm-hmm. with this stuff. Yeah, this is a definite like the most gangster track on the album, and I mean that because it's literally about a gangster, a stool pigeon, if you if it were. So, uh, and it's like vaguely rapped a little. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. There's definitely some rap, or like, vaguely rapped is a good way of putting it, Jeremy. I applaud your worded. Thank you. That's why I'm here. Well, I mean, you know, hip hop culture was invented in New York not too long before this, so it would make sense that August would have been on the forefront of that genre as well. Well, I am ready to go gangster here. Thank you for listening to I'd Buy That for a Dollar. My name is Peter Cook. I'm Jeremy Ruggles. I'm Sean Hartman. And I'm Lauren, and I'm happy to be here. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) All right. Thank you, Lauren. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me.